Chris Greenstein, as you just heard, and I am the director of the STI AIDS Clinical Trials Unit at Fundação Oswaldo Cruz in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and I am the International AIDS Society President-elect. I think it's really fair to say that the outstanding results of the Purpose One trial have been and continue to be one of the standout media stories of AIDS 2024. The full results uh, published today in the New England Journal of Medicine will no doubt keep the topic of HIV prevention alive. But we now need to turn to early and serious conversations around access. Long-acting long injectables, including long-acting cabotegravir, for which we continue to see consistent data on safety and effectiveness, and is already on the market, are game changers in the HIV response, especially in low- and middle-income countries with high HIV prevalence among the most vulnerable populations. We clearly need to learn the lessons from the 80s and 90s during the AIDS pandemic when we saw entire regions starved of access to life-saving antiretrovirals that were readily available in the global north. And, of course, in the latest pandemic, COVID-19, we were reminded once again how unacceptable vaccine inequity is when responding to a global crisis, health crisis. I am delighted that this media roundtable will be one of the first forums to begin these vital discussions, and I'm even more delighted to be joined by such a high-powered <coughs> cast of speakers today. I'm conscious that we have very little time, but a lot of interest, so let's get started. The idea of these official media roundtables is to get the discussion going, so we will hear very briefly from our speakers and then open it up for questions. I'm sure there are many. I will just say that today's event aims to connect breaking science with questions around access and community impact. Many of you in this room have covered or are covering the Lena Kapavir story. Today, we want to connect the science with the broader impact that long-acting prevention tools more broadly can have in responding to and ending the epidemic. So, some quick housekeeping notes. This roundtable is in-person only, and all information shared here today is on the record, unless otherwise indicated by a speaker. After we have heard from each of our speakers, we will open the discussion to questions. Please indicate your media outlet and who you would like to direct your question to. With that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Linda Gayle Becker. Linda Gayle is the Chief Executive Officer at the Desmond Tutu Health Foundation, Deputy Director, Professor of Medicine at the Desmond Tutu HIV Center, and of course, the leading investigator on the Purpose One trial. Please, Linda Gayle, go ahead. Thank you. I think I'm being instructed to move this. So that can, but that was going to be a problem. Obviously, I'm very excited. Um, <laughs> having just presented the uh, the purpose one uh, trials up results, and I won't go through it. You heard that there's actually a paper uh, available uh, today as well in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, but in brief, uh, this was a trial run in uh, Cape Town uh, in South Africa and Uganda in 28 sites, um, and we enrolled roughly 5,000 people into the randomized component of the trial. These were young women uh, aged 16 to 25. Uh, this is a, a unique design which has also been published. And so the primary endpoint uh, of this study, which was randomized in a two to two to one of Lena Kapavir, six monthly injectable PrEP, FTAF oral PrEP taken daily, and FTDF as, as an active control, uh, in the third arm, so two, uh, twice as much Lena Kapavir and FTAF as FTDF. These women uh, were then followed up uh, frequently, uh, obviously the injectable being given six monthly, and the primary endpoint, as mentioned, was really to compare to the background incidence. Uh, so this is the unique sort of uh, design of, of the clinical trial. The background incidence was uh, uh, assessed by uh, women coming into screening, uh, being tested for HIV, and if they tested positive um, at screening, they then their samples were sent for uh, a, a, a recency test and a, a validity assay. So this is how we were able to discover the background incidence, which is the primary endpoint. The 
Bottom line is lenacapavir was 100% more effective than the background incidence um, uh, in terms of its incidence. And the um, FTAP uh, was comparable to background incidence, as was FTDF. Again, to explain this, we did show the adherence data today, uh, which was measured in drug levels, uh, in red blood spots, from dry blood spots, uh, from these participants. And what we saw is that, unfortunately, as we've often seen in young people around, around the world, frankly, but often amongst young uh, women in my region, is that taking oral uh, PrEP is challenging. And so although there was a reasonable uptake at the beginning, this does did uh, come decrease over time. Um, and so we believe that that explains why, although oral PrEP is highly effective, um, and oral FTAF has also been shown to be as effective as oral FTDA, that we did not see that efficacy amongst young women. So again, the secondary aim of the study, lenacapavir injectable, six-monthly injectable, was 100% uh, more effective, had a, a, an incident rate ratio of zero compared to FTDF, um, but the FTAF and the FTDF were comparable uh, in, in the result. So that is uh, purpose one. We're very delighted that it um, is now in the open label phase as per protocol. Uh, the, res the results of the interim came out on the 18th of June, and today already uh, hundreds of women are being offered the opportunity to switch if they wish, um, and the study is ongoing in the open label phase. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda Gale. So our next speaker is Dr. Jared Bacon. Jared is a Senior Vice President, Virologic Therapeutical Area Head at Gideon Sciences. Please, Jared. Thank you, Beatrice. And Thank you, Linda Gale. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I, I have to say, personally, I've worked on HIV prevention my entire career, first in academia and more recently at Gilead Sciences, and for 20 years I've worked on PrEP. And this is one of those days where you both, uh, there are both smiles and tears to be able to get to, be able to, get to this moment. Um, I'll talk first about the science and then secondly about, about access. Um, purpose one, is the first of two phase three trials planned for, that have been planned for evaluating one type of year for PrEP. Purpose one, obviously we've heard the results today. Purpose two is an ongoing trial among cisgender men, transgender women and transgender men and gender non-binary individuals, a global trial with more than 3,000 individuals in it. It is fully enrolled and will have results at the end of this year, beginning of next. We look forward to those results. Together, the results of purpose one and two together would form a regulatory package, um, both scientifically and both also because we have been told by community and by the scientific community to have as broad of a population as possible. So to be able to have women, cisgender men, and transgender and, and gender diverse individuals will be able to provide the most complete information. So we await the results of purpose two. In the meantime, Lena Capavir is not approved anywhere globally and we await the regulatory filing. And we are dedicated to the women of, who have volunteered for Purpose One, and as Linda Gale has said, um, just two weeks, just a few weeks after receiving these results, already have, con already have been able to offer open-label lenacapavir, uh, something I think has never been done in a PrEP trial this fast before. Those are the, that, is the, that is the state of the science, and I'd be happy to talk, talk more about that. I would also emphasize that we have really listened and learned from decades of PrEP research in developing the work in Purpose One how quickly rolled over to open label, the inclusion of adolescents within the trial, as Linda Gale emphasized during the talk today, the ability to uh, continue study medication in individuals who became pregnant in the purpose program, and thus be able to have safety efficacy data <coughs> in pregnancy in adolescents at the same time as phase three primary read out is unique. And we are very proud to then listen to community and to the world to be able to make that true. In terms of access, uh, Gilead, broadly, has been committed to communities affected and impacted by HIV all around the world and has worked for more than three decades on HIV treatment and prevention and innovations that make differences and impact for everyone everywhere. Indeed, our goal would be we would like nothing more than to not work on HIV at all. We say all the time at, at Gilead we would like to end the epidemic for everyone everywhere and that is a collective vision, I think, of all of us at this table. We are, um, we are working to make sure that Lena Capavir has global access for HIV prevention. We have prioritized speed, 
volume as we are making this forward, as we are moving this, uh, as we're moving this forward. So when prioritizing speed, we have in sought the most efficient pathway to regulatory approval and broad availability as we are thinking about this. We are moving forward with a robust direct voluntary licensing program that will enable the largest number of generic manufacturers to be able to provide a to provide lemon capture at the large volumes needed for low for low income settings. And in the meantime, we are we have uh, committed to being able to provide volume in a ring fence way, a dedicated volume for low income settings so that there is so that there is availability of the medication until the time that generic companies are able to make low cost generic options available for low income settings. And we are committed to doing so until that time is until that time is happening, and we are moving forward with urgency at this moment to make that true. So we are prioritizing speed, volume, and aiming for aiming for access price that will be able to make that true. And the volume that we will provide for low-income settings will be available at access price. And we are looking to partner because it is, but it is partnership that will make this true. It is political will. It is with government. It is with advocacy. It is with scientists. We all must come together to make truth of ending the HIV epidemic through all of the mechanisms that we can for truth. And we are looking forward to partnership to make sure that implementation is successful. Because as great as a scientific presentation is, or a paper, or a p-value is, none of that actually makes, none of that is really what the impact, when the impact occurs. And we would like the impact to be real. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jared. And next, we will hear from Sinead Delaney Moretti, who is a professor at the Wits University and the HPTN 084 uh, chair. And she will be uh, presenting to, uh, and she is presenting in this conference uh, data on pregnancy and carbotegravir, further data. And we would like to hear from you, Sinead. Thanks very much, Beatrice. And I think I should start off by just acknowledging the incredible results of my colleagues here and uh, kind of share, I think, the excitement in what this means for HIV prevention, particularly in, in our region of the world. Uh, so the data that the, we will present at the conference tomorrow uh, is data from the HPTN 084 Open Label Extension. We have continued to follow participants in uh, HPTN 084 and in the open label extension, participants were no longer required to use contraception. We saw very high pregnancy incidence of about 12% and women who became pregnant who had chosen cabotegravir were offered the opportunity to consent to continue taking injections during pregnancy. Uh, and what we have seen uh, in the data that we've accumulated so far is that people who chose to use uh, cabotegravir during pregnancy uh, generally, uh, uh, sorry, Cabtegura was self, uh, safe and well tolerated. We didn't see any HIV infections uh, among pregnant women. There were no maternal deaths, and the pregnancy and infant outcomes were similar in those people who had uh, experienced CAB use uh, compared to uh, those who had no CAB use, but also <coughs> uh, consistent with background rates where we don't expect uh, any product use. Uh, we also did some work to explore whether pregnancy would have an impact on the dose requirements and haven't seen any need for change in dosing, which is also really important. So I think to Beatrice's comment about why these data are important in terms of access, uh, really what this allows us to do is accelerate access to effective PrEP agents, but also kind of antiretrovirals more broadly for pregnant and lactating people. And historically, this population has been excluded from trials, and this has led to data on safety and pregnancy really lagging behind data for sort of adults and other populations up to kind of six to 10 years. Uh, and that means that pregnant and lactating people who might benefit from these medicines are either not able to use them or healthcare providers are using them when they have no data about uh, any safety or dose uh, issues. Uh, so we believe that these data are timeless because we're seeing the scale up of cabotegravir in many national programs, particularly in Eastern and Southern Africa, so Zambia, Zimbabwe, Malawi, and now we've heard uh, South Africa. Uh, and these are areas where we see high fertility rates and strong desires to become pregnant while avoiding uh, acquiring HIV. 
Uh, so we think these data will now allow um, healthcare providers and PrEP users to make decisions about whether to use uh, CAB in pregnancy. <coughs> we don't think it's over. We are continuing to do work to understand uh, CAB dosing requirements of people initiating CAB during pregnancy, and we also want to understand CAB concentrations in uh, lactating people so we can provide more data to people about safety during, during uh, lactation. Thank you so much, Sinead. And our next speaker is uh, Dr. Kimberly Smith, who is the Vice President and Head of uh, R&D at Give Healthcare. It was, of course, Give Healthcare's innovative science that delivered long-acting PrEP and the first and only long-acting injectable cabotegravir for HIV prevention and treatment currently on the market today. Go ahead, please. Well, first, let me add my uh, congratulations to my colleagues at, at, at Juliet and uh, Linda Gale. Uh, what an excellent uh, study and excellent outcome. This is really tremendous news for the community and for cisgender women. And we very strongly agree with the importance of choice and giving individuals options for HIV treatment and prevention. The results we saw today from the purpose trial are reminiscent of the HBTN 084 study that examined long-acting cabotegavir um, for prevention in women, as there were no serial conversions in the women who received cabotegavir long-acting as prescribed in that study. We continue to present data on the effectiveness of CAB for PrEP here at this meeting, as uh, Sinead has just shared. We shared uh, pregnancy data from the 084 study showing uh, strong safety and pharmacokinetics. This too is really excellent news for cisgender women who need prevention options that can be taken safely during pregnancy. Having great data and options for HIV PrEP are only valuable if we can get them into the hands of people who need them. Viv has made a significant contribution to making our medications available globally that's illustrated by the fact that more than 24 million individuals in, across the world are on a WTEGAVIR-based regimen as a result of our uh, access commitment. We have a similar commitment for uh, long-acting cabotegavir in the areas of greatest need. Following our FDA approval in late 2021, in July of 2022, we signed a voluntary license agreement with the UN-backed medicine patent pool, or MPP. Through this, three manufacturers will produce and supply generic versions of CAB-LA for PrEP to 90 low- and middle-income countries where over 70% of all new HIV infections occurred in 2020. This is subject to local regulatory approval. We have committed to providing more than a million doses over the next couple of years at a not-for-profit price while the generics are up to, uh, are working on making their products available. We're proud that more than 20 com countries have regulatory approvals for Apogee. 75% 70 are in research and remote setting, 50% are in Sub-Saharan Africa. We're seeing rollout of Apogee in these countries just two years after the rollout in the US. The rollout has begun in Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Malawi with other companies country initiation imminent, and just this week we heard that South Africa has a plan to begin rolling out long-acting CAB for PrEP by year end. Long-acting for PrEP has the potential to be transformative and have a tremendous impact on the HIV epidemic, hopefully ultimately contributing to getting us to the end of the epidemic. And this is including Sub-Saharan Africa, where the burden of HIV is greater. We are pleased to see additional options become available to help in this fight. Mm. Yes. Thank you very much, Kim. That was mm. really great. And I'm now very excited to have UNA's Executive Director, Winnie Binyamina, with us today. Winnie, a warm welcome and over to you. Thank you very much. My starting point is this report that we issued two days ago, the UNAIDS, UNAIDS update, and we call it the urgency of now. Why? Because the world set a target 
to end AIDS as a public health threat by 2030. We are six years away. Mm -hmm. We still have 1.3 million new infections around the world. We have to close that gap to reach that point six years from now. Now, my starting point is that two companies, Gilead and V, have got miracle products for prevention. Lena Kapaviv and what's already on the market, the Kabla, which is a two monthly injectable. Lena Kapaviv, six monthly injectable. You have heard how miraculous it is. 100% of patients. So, our, your needs, our concern is we want this miracle prevention, both of them, combinations of them, to reach all the people who need it, who need a prevention. So we are about speed, scale, and price. Those are the three things we're trying to support these companies to achieve. On speed, we've been talking with that. We're saying, move quickly to license generic producers because the generic producers are the ones who will bring the price down and serve all the countries, low and middle income particularly, where the majority of people who are at risk live. So we're saying move quickly to licensing. Don't go slowly by slowly talking about ramping up volumes because that will delay us. We want it now within six years' time. So we want to work with these companies to speed up the process of getting generics to produce. In the past, we've seen delays. Now we don't want to see delays. We think there are ways around it. We can talk about that. Still, we say to these amazing heroes of the HIV struggle, media, that you know what? You can't license and should license generics to make for not just low income countries, but also middle income countries. Why? Because 97% of people living with HIV are living in these middle income and rich countries. Right? And people at risk in huge numbers as well. We're saying, if you don't license for the middle income countries, you will be leaving out millions of people who are at risk and will not be their target. But my concern is that I'm still hearing Julia talking about high incidence countries and resource limited countries. That for me is a language about high incidence African countries, those are low income, resource limited, again it is the low income countries. I want to, we want media to move quickly and confirm to us that middle income countries will also be, they will license for that. That is the same issue. Remember, this product <coughs> is for who? This is not a Gucci handbag for mm -hmm. rich people. This is a product for people who live on the margins. Mm -hmm. These are not people only in poor countries of Africa. These are people in the margins, in the favelas of Brazil, mm -hmm. middle income countries. These are poor people on the margins, criminalized, stigmatized in countries like Jamaica, rich, Indonesia, and so on. So who pays for them? Who cares about them? They are in rich, they are in poor countries. This brings me the issue of price. We want these heroes of the response to bring the prices down as fast as possible. And how is that going to happen? It's really by having competition, many generic producers having a race to the bottom of price. That works. So we want the companies to put their technology in the medicine patent pool. Why is that? Because the medicine patent pool 
guarantee the public interest if the UN backed platform if you ensure licensing goes to companies that will serve the whole world and with the agreement of these companies, generic companies are enough companies to meet that issue of going down on price. Why is it still on price? We don't want billions with this magical miracle product to choose a handful of generic producers who will then create a cartel, rather like OPEC. Remember what OPEC has done to the world? Any time you remember the past, 73, 79, two, they are always able to get together and hide the price. So if it's easy for a small number of companies to come together and agree to keep a price high, it's not to gather this gas. We want to get them to compete and keep prices down. That's another issue we want to discuss. So my last point is we recognize these are companies. They are about making profits. They are not like me who works for just a, a salary from government. We want them to make profits and we want to do the calculations with them. We want transparency on all the costs so that we know what is the profit they want to make. We also want to challenge them on the model of their company. They must not obsess about shareholders being the ones who must get the profit. Profits also must take into account communities, consumers of this product. They must take into account the workers in their factories. So we want a shareholder kind of capitalism. We don't want a shareholder kind of capitalism, a model where only shareholders matter. Let not the shareholders decide the price. Let it be about consumers who are poor people in the life and their communities. Let it be about the whole world. So that's my our point. We will accompany, we are in conversations, with these two heroes. I keep saying they are heroes of the HIV movement and, um, and uh, they brought prices down to where they are today. They are responsible for getting the 31 million people on treatment today. But today, we want them to rise and do the right thing to hit the 2030 target. Kimberly, we want Kabla, we salute V for bringing Kabla price down close to a generic price. But still, the middle-income countries are telling me it is still too high. It's not affordable in middle-income countries. They're saying it is like double, four times the price of the oro crack. Their governments are not buying it for them. So we need to push that price down. Speed, <coughs> scale, price. Thank you so much, Winnie, for such inspiring words. And now we will move to our last and final speaker, who is Yvette Raphael. And Yvette is the executive director and co-founder of the new Advocacy for Prevention of HIV and AIDS in South Africa. Today, she will share with us the community perspectives. Thank you. Over to you, Yvette. Thank you so much. First of all, I'd like to congratulate everyone on this table for the innovations that you've been able to we are at the perfect time and the perfect state that era of long acting and multi-purpose technologies. Science is evolving and science is moving fast. Science is ahead of us. We, are, we have more products showing efficacy than we've ever seen before, especially long acting. Access to these products remain a challenge in our community and country. Choice for us as community remains the viable. Choice for us remains the gospel that we will preach. Like you say, LDB, rings, jabs, and pokes. We are in a prevention revolution. We are in a time where we will demand all of these products. Uh, as you said, we need speed, scale, equity, also equals impact. These innovations mean nothing unless they are impact in the women in our community. Women in low and middle income countries need these products. We demand developers to make these products affordable, Eid and Gilead, as well as IPA. <coughs> we demand our governments to invest in choice, not only one product. 
We remind scientists to prioritize post-trial access for all of our participants, like the theme of this conference, put people first. There is no magic bullet or one size fits all. Women want everything that you have given. Thank you. Thank you so much, that That was really great. And now uh, we will be happy to take your questions. Please indicate your media outlet and who you would like to direct your question to. We will then direct the question to the nominated panelists. Please keep your questions brief. And I remind you that after we finish here today, you will have an opportunity to speak one-on-one -on -one with some of our speakers. Okay, let's uh, begin. Please. Thank you. I'm Shobha Shukla from Citizen News Service India. We are also official media partners for AIDS 2024. I'm so glad to have such a big woman force on the panel, which is rare to come about. I'm very glad for that. Historically, it has happened that the fruits of science take so long to translate into public health gains. It happens over and over again. For example, the female condom, I come from India, many women do not even know that it exists today, after so many years. So what do we do? Every time a new product comes into the market, science does its work, and then we have to struggle to make it accessible for those whom it was meant. Shouldn't there be a roadmap that at every stage we are hoping to get an HIV vaccine, we are hoping to get better prevention options. Every time we have to... Sorry, every time we have to fight for it, shouldn't there be a roadmap? I appeal to the women on the panel. Okay, so Thank you. who are you directing your question? To anybody. Mm. So, uh, Yvette, would you like to take this one? Quick, please, we have Sorry. several questions. I, I, I cannot agree with you more. I think one of the mistakes we made is that we punch products against each other. And ensuring choice becomes available as well as co educating our communities that when one product comes a, a, becomes available, as well as our government, that we shouldn't throw the other one out of the window. So currently what we have in our clinics in, on, on the ground is condoms, it's VMMC, all of those that are available, including PrEP, those are the ones that we need to continue to, to talk about until all of these medical products become available and accessible in our communities. We have prevention methods, but we must tell our communities to continue to use those that are available. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, so please. Thank you. Yes, um, Thank you. My name is Mia Malani from South Africa, from the Becky Sisa Center for Health Journalism. And my question is for Jared from um, Gilead. Um, Winnie and Yema has mentioned that when we have, when we're issuing voluntary licenses, we should go through the medicine's patent pool, and my understanding is that Juliet would be issuing it directly. Is that correct? And if so, why did you make a different choice? And the second half is, would you prioritize different facilities in different regions of the world? So with CAP LA, we've seen three companies from India. Would Africa perhaps be a priority? Thank you for the question. And um, as the person on the panel who is X chromosome deficient, I want to really <laughs> celebrate, uh, celebrate all of my colleagues and friends that are here. And also celebrate today. This is today with Purpose One is the first time where we've had the trial, a trial in women read out first uh, for the prevention. So to your question, um, thank you. Uh, we, are, we are prioritizing direct voluntary licensing because because of the importance of speed. And I was really struck by the commonality with, with Ms. Bianima and our goals. The speed, we say volume, scale, it's the same, and, and a price that is affordable for, for low resource settings. And the speed, it cannot be, cannot be faster. We are, working, we are working in parallel for simultaneous regulatory filings, not delays between between one setting and another. We are working with, we are working to set up voluntary licensees with generic manufacturers. And to your second question, looking right now at generic manufacturers across regions to be able to find who is qualified, to be able to produce high quality, low cost, and enough generic manufacturers to be able to, to both um, to both to both provide and provide the high volumes that I hope are the work of country. Our, our our actions are driven 
completely by this idea of holding to speed and at the volume that it's going to be needed for the book. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Fortunately, that is a small number of individuals, and actually I'm incredibly proud that the first um, approval that we sought for this important medication was in those individuals who need new medicines, often more than anybody else. Um, of course, that is, a, that is a different reference point, given the severity of that disease and the small number of individuals, fortunately. That is a different reference point than for prevention. I am very optimistic. I am very positive about talking, uh, including with Germany, to, make, to understand the prevention needs. There are far too many new infections that occur in the European community in general and in Germany each year, and new prevention options beyond what already exists are absolutely needed. Thank you, Jared. Please go ahead. So the, the country list for generic licenses is not, it, we are, it is not finalized yet, and we are in the process of talking with generic manufacturers. We will certainly have that discussion, we'll certainly have the discussion of what are the right countries, and we'll talk about the breadth of those licenses when they are finished. At the same time, we, think we recognize my category as having potential global impact. And Gilead, as well as our colleagues in work around the world for HIV treatment in all kinds of in all in countries around the world, of small and large and mid, low, middle, and high income areas. <coughs> and we really want to be able to have the impact in treatment and in prevention that we that the global world needs. So on the list, we will have the list. When, when the agreements are finalized, we'll be able to have the list. And beyond that, we, are, we want to ensure that places, that places with, um, with high burden of HIV and need for new prevention agents, wherever they fall on the map, we want to work as hard as we can to make sure that access is available. The thing is this. If we can do this in the <coughs> old days, instead of do that, we can find this, we talk to the shareholder. <laughs> <laughs> because I think I can convince them to take a smaller profit and serve and help us win this by 2030 by reaching everybody. And I am sure they can get a Nobel Prize. I cannot talk about specific manufacturers right now. While, while we're in. But we're, we're in discussions with generic manufacturers. We, and I want to say Gilead has a tremendous history through of generic manufacturers. We were the first to release, to, release, like, to release intellectual property for HIV medications and account for more than half of the HIV drugs in the medicine patent pool already. In, in times of COVID, Gilead worked directly with with, fun, with uh, direct voluntary licensees the world over to produce millions of doses, including in India. Um, I can't talk about specific um, manufacturers right now. Just an additional question is on uh, you know, there have been consistent concern with the lack of funds for HIV prevention programs. Mm -hmm. And that's what is a sense that I get by moving around the global village. Would you like to talk about it? it it's true that our report shows that prevention is lagging behind treatment. Mm -hmm. See, there's more money for treatment, with less money for prevention. And again, it's about who is this product for? Who is going to generate the millions for the shareholders of Gilead and also for B? It is very important for marginalized people, stigmatized, criminalized people, who are high. Their governments don't like them. So we need to get this price down as low as possible in order to persuade governments to don't value these people to buy for them. That is why prices key here. And that's why middle income countries are key here. They have their volume, they have people who are at risk. Because many of the key populations are at risk are in middle income countries. They have the people. So the volumes are there, 
but it's just we need to get the shareholders to accept a smaller profit. It's about not maximizing profit. It's about reaching the volumes of people, getting a smaller profit, and then everybody is served. But it's true, governments are not putting the money down for prevention. We need to bring the price down as low as possible in order to get as more people served. Thank you, Winnie. In the back, do you have a question? No, please go ahead. Although trials may be run in specific countries or particular regions, the idea is to be representative of really everybody who needs prevention around the world, as Winnie has said. Um, and speaking specifically to Purpose One, which was run in Uganda and South Africa, East and Southern Africa, we really do believe that these results are uh, you know, representative and, and applicable to cisgender women all over the world. Um, and so, you know, like Kabatega of Long Acting, we really hope to see these reaching women wherever they are who need uh, HIV prevention. So I think it does come back to recognizing that. I think Winnie's right. I think our governments also need to be called to the table. Why aren't they putting more money at prevention? I mean, you know, it, 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 it prevention isn't always the, a five-year plan. It's a longer plan, right, to, to stop infections is, is, a, is something that I think our governments really need to be called uh, to address. Um, and, you know, for too long, they've tended to say, all right, we have to do treatment, but prevention can be left to donors or can be left to, to other people or indeed is a nice to have. And I think, you know, the UNAIDS report and other reports now really putting a focus. I was asked today, I'm going to say this, this conference in 2024 in Munich, Germany, is about us saying it is prevention where we need to be putting our focus now. Yes, we have, you know, and it's brilliant, I've got 31 million people on treatment, we've got to find another 7, 8 million out there. But if we don't start preventing, this epidemic will go on for decades and decades and decades. And so, you know, that sustainable plan is a problem for all of us. And, and our governments also need to come to the table, I think, on, on, on this. So I would join you in shouting out to the Nigerian government that they also need to say, here is an opportunity to save young women and girls um, in, 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 in the country of Nigeria, and they need to put some money on the table if they believe that that's worth doing. If I may add to what Linda has said, I 100% agree with Linda. I keep saluting Gideon. Because what they have got now is actually a feminist product. It is a feminist product and it's a product for Africa. Because in Africa, new infections amongst young people, three out of four new infections are of girls and young women. The 
identified the six of them, you will have six out of seven in some countries are young girl, uh, girls and young women, adolescent girls. Now, this is a product that is completely in their hands. They do not have to negotiate safe sex with a man over this issue of HIV. They need to prevent other infection. But for the, this is the next product to be my producer. So yes. uh, if she has that injection, if she has that injection, she's safe. She doesn't have to worry that she's going to get HIV. This I call it a feminist product. And for girls, for Africa, this is magical. Need to get it. Just to add a positive on, on this note, uh, around Nigeria, uh, we, we know that actually Cat Pedigree is in country and the rollout of Cat Pedigree is the PrEP is uh, long term Cat Pedigree the PrEP stimulant. And so, it, you know, again, the, you know, we're making progress at, I, I, you know, no one is, it's, it's, it's not at the lightning speed that everyone would like. But there's there's tremendous progress being made in the countries where uh, we're working. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, Kim, for the questions, please go ahead. Johannes Rostischer from the German Public Radio Station BR, Jewish Road from Munich. One more question about the price, maybe to Rini. Uh, you said as low as possible. What what would be a figure which could be realistic for a generic uh, injection? Well. I think we know that there is um, there's prep that has come down up to about 23 pounds per person per year. If you could get the price of the Lakapa being down to $40 per person per year, and there are some, some researchers who said that it's possible, and I don't know, but if you could get down there, we then we have a fighting chance to get governments put their money down to buy it for their people. And Janet, you're not, you're not a, gener a generic man, but uh, what do you think? Is it realistic $40 per person per year? The key it's a for generic production uh, <coughs> for a product? Yeah, the, the, the key for, for low resource settings, the key to uh, the key to getting as low as possible is, is, is actually is commitment. Is that, the, that prevention is going to be important, and then volume. Volume has driven the price for has driven the price for um, antivirals around the world for two decades now. Thank you, Kim. Do you want to add anything on that? Well, I mean, you know, uh, all I can say is that for us, we have we have not the profit side. So that means that we basically what the, what it costs to make us is make it is what what we sell for low income countries. And so, and 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 Jared is exactly right. As we increase the volume, as more commitment is is made then the, the price can go down, and so that's, that's the thing that we can I mean, I would also just add just on sort of, you know, decades of doing this, that having a, a generic company in a part of the world where it might be made more cheaply, just simply because we can make things perhaps more cheaply in another part of the world, is obviously another reason to speak to generic companies from many regions around the world um, mm -hmm. to try and get that price down. Thank you. One last question. Anyone wants, please? Um, just to wrap up, to your yeah. time, where would you like to continue? Where are you from? Oh, sorry. I'm uh, Caleb Hawk from Joy Action Union to get on track. When you have that directed towards you, but in two years' time, when we have the ACE 2026 conference, where would you be satisfied with regard to the expansion of this innovation? What would be a few miles that we have? In two years' time, if we could have generic companies named and already beginning to produce, to produce volumes for, for the market in low and middle income countries, that would be great. They have lenses, they know the companies, and they are getting themselves ready to do that. I know there are stages, and we have to show them. So in three years' time, if we have lenses and generics are
But I do think it is important to remember that the manufacture of some of these products is very complicated. And, and Travis Eggerbeer in particular, the nanomill uh, product that makes it the, the, the transfer of technology is not an overnight thing. It is difficult to do. And so you know, they are working as fast as they can, and we are supporting them as much as we can, and we are supplying in the meantime until they are up to uh, regular supply. But to complete my answer, years and saying, let us remember how quickly COVID vaccines yes. were brought to market. We want that speed. Mm -hmm. We cannot go slow for HIV and say it's more complicated. When they were telling us vaccines are even more complicated. Mm -hmm. So let's go speed the speed. We took and COVID is the speed we want for HIV. So, can, I, can I just add, Beatrice, I'm so sorry. I do think though that we don't want to avoid while we're waiting for the generic companies. I mean, and, and I would just say that the places where trials are run at least should have access to these products, you know, whether it's from the originator or hopefully in the future from the generic company. We cannot have a void where we don't see these miracles get into the hands of the people who, who've contributed to the science. So I would just say, I would hope that the, the, the scale up of the originator Mm -hmm. And that's the commitment that we've made, is that we continue to supply for all the individuals who participate in the clinical trial as we are rolling out in the country. Yeah. And our, our commitment as well to the participants in the trials, but also uh, to, to global regulatory filings, which will need to occur over the next few years, to be able to seek approval in a variety of settings, and then production at large volume 